Hello everyone. Dear Eric Labay, President of uh, IP Paris. Dear Adriana Tapu, uh, Director of the Doctoral School of IP Paris. François Weff, Director of Ahmad um, Mathematics um, Doctoral School. Uh, dear uh, Dr. Bechard Bezardi, um, the Vice President of Engineering of Google Zurich, whom we will be honored to listen to through uh, his following keynotes. Dear all professors, and heads of research areas of IP Paris Doctoral School, dear members of IP Paris administration, dear families, and dear graduates and colleagues from IP Paris Doctoral School, welcome to IP Paris Doctoral Graduation Ceremony Class of 2021. So I'm Lucy Liversin, graduate from IP Paris Master Degree in Innovation 2021, and currently enrolled in a doctoral school almost at uh, the end of my first year of my PhD in Management Science. And I'm very honored to be here and to introduce incredible speakers today. Without wasting any minute to our wonderful set of speakers, I will start, I will start with the first introduction. Um, he is the president of Ecole Polytechnique since uh, September 2018 and president of Institute Polytechnique de Paris created in May 2019 by Ecole Polytechnique and Star Paris and Sci Paris, Telecom Paris and Telecom Sud Paris. In his previous roles, um, he was a senior partner at McKinsey and chairman of McKinsey Global Institute where he conducted many research projects please give a warm applause to Eric Labaye. <clears throat> so dear PhD graduates of uh, Institut Politique de Paris, it's a great honor and pleasure uh, to uh, welcome all of you, to celebrate you today on this graduation day, surrounded by your families and friends, which also I'm delighted to welcome to uh, Institut Politique de Paris in the Amphitheater Poincaré at Ecole Polytechnique. Uh, and it's great to have all of you here today. After two long years of uh, events, graduation that couldn't take place uh, in presence, I'm really glad also we can make it together today in the Amphitheater and uh, that you are going to be able to receive your diploma in person. This moment is unique for you and we want to make it memorable. And uh, I know we are going to have a, a great moment together uh, to celebrate uh, this achievement. First, I would just like to congratulate you for this diploma and, uh, and your PhD. You are 228 brilliant students to receive this degree, and each of you should be proud of it. It's a recognition of your excellence uh, research skills, of your hard work, of your commitment. You have demonstrated throughout the years you spend with us here at Institut Polytechnique de Paris and at the two doctoral schools uh, that were mentioned before, the IP Paris Doctoral School and the Adamar Doctoral School of Mathematics. By following a PhD program at Institut Polytechnique de Paris, you join a new institution, as Lucy said, created a few years ago but based on more than 200 years of history of the five founding schools. And these schools have been training highly skilled engineers uh, for many years, but they join also forces to train future leaders and generate research of excellence and impact. Coming from all over the world, you're from different backgrounds and life experience, you understood the project, you understood the ambition, and decided to trust the institute with your higher education and your development. You made the choice to increase your scientific strike force and stay in the way of technical excellence. The scientific excellence, Institut Polytechnique de Paris proved it again uh, in the last few weeks, uh, and I would use uh, the ranks by rank, you know, top 50 in the world, one of the top two institutions in France, and uh, also number one in employability and um, among the top 12 in the world. Your predecessors actually are proof of the high employability of the excellence, scientific excellence, of the degree you will receive. More than 60% of them already found their jobs before their thesis defense, and the employability rate is almost 100%. So I hope 
these different elements, not only, but make you proud of the degree and also gives you confidence in your future career. This increased reputation, this strong success in building solid and fulfilling programs, we draw them from all the resources at Institut Polytechnique de Paris, and in particular, the different labs of the different schools and the eminent researchers, professors, you have been able to interact with throughout your degree. Moreover, you have been able to get an amazing pluridisciplinary training anchored in scientific rigor while cultivating human relations, soft skills with a diverse and international environment. And you are living proof of that diversity. Almost half of you are internationals. The great majority coming from Europe and Asia, but also some of you coming from South America, North America, or the Middle East and Africa. By graduating from these PhD programs, you signify that you believe in the power of science and technology to respond to rapid changes and transformations. Also, to shape a brighter and more sustainable future for society as a whole. You are all united around the values that we value at Institut Politique de Paris and that we hope you, uh, you got and we help you uh, acquire during the few years with us here. First, excellence and talent. You made it through your graduation within programs that require rigor and commitment. And as I said before, you should be really proud of this achievement, especially also in a complicated context with the pandemic. I would like to take this opportunity also to thank Professor Adriana Tapus, director of the doctoral school, Professor Francois Weff, representative of the Adamar School, all your supervisors, your prime directors, all the researchers you interacted with, as they have been active contributors to your academic success. So, a round of applause for all the people who helped you achieve what you have been doing. The second value at IP Paris beyond, beyond excellence and talent is our strong, belie strong belief in the power of collectiveness, diversity and open-mindedness to move mountains. You know, you can achieve a lot of things by yourself, but it's in teams we achieve the most. As you learned also how to conduct a research by yourself, it helps you gain audacity as well as self-direction and leadership skills. But you also acquire the great sense of patience and learn to surround yourself with the, with the right people. I'm sure also this has helped you develop interpersonal skills and a sense of respect, highly sought after in the professional world and crucial to be fulfilled in your future career or to build impactful initiatives. Third value is innovation. An innovation empowered by partnerships between every society's stakeholders, including the industrial world. You know this is necessary to tackle the major economic and societal challenges that we are facing, including clean energy, climate change, artificial intelligence, data analysis, biomedical engineering, and so on. I hope you took full advantage of these rich networks of people you got access to at IP Paris, and that some of you will join the innovation network and maybe also create your own startups, as many of the former graduates have been doing. As you may know, a third of the founders or managers of the next 40 companies, that is for France, are alumni for I, from IP Paris, and many of them have a PhD uh, as, a, as a diploma. As your name will appear on the screen throughout the ceremony, you will probably look back at your time here, and I hope with great memories uh, of the last few years. Now I would like also to think about what this degree means to you for your future career. And I would like to leave you with three wishes, if I may say, to think about as you think about the next stage. My first wish is simple, it's just to continue to live the values of Institut Pérenne de Paris. Excellence, solidarity and teamwork, and innovation. Spread these values wherever you are, and I hope they will help you guide your own success. The second wish I would have is that you, know, you realize you have the power to make the world better. 
in fact, to shape the world. Many challenges are in front of us. I mentioned a few of them. The evolution of the climate, the impact of digital, uh, health, the fact of having a sustainable planet with you know, 8 billion inhabitants, a lot of ethical questions, a lot of geopolitical moves. By being PhD graduates, you have helped you know, many scientific domain progress. And therefore, you already have made your mark on science. Now you have the responsibility to take up basically some of his learnings, capabilities, and to address the key societal challenges. In, in, a, in a, other words, somehow transcend the science and technology capabilities for the benefit of business and society. Wherever you are going, following an academic research, an academic career, joining an industry research center, joining, you know, large global research organization or any other government organization, I wish you will be actors of change, driving forces of progress, show initiatives, and also keep learning. My third wish is that you continue, because I'm sure you have been doing that already in, in the last few years, but you continue to be a source of inspiration for others, be leaders. I believe one of the key for success anywhere is to be able to rally people, to build teams, to, lay, to lead others to fulfill their passion, their aspiration, and somehow to surpass themselves. And to be inspiring, be inspired also by many of the mentors you may have had in the laboratories, in your networks, also in the alumni of the schools, alumni of IP Paris. So take advantage of this rich community, because as I said, Leading others will help you fulfill your aspirations or solve some of the most difficult problems we are facing today. In just a bit, you will all receive your diploma, and also the laureates of the Thesis Awards will be announced. I would like already to congratulate all of them for their particularly outstanding performance. Finally, you are carving out the way for your peers behind you. You are now becoming among the first ambassadors of Institut Polytechnique de Paris, helping our recognition as a leading education and research institution, and more specifically our PhD programs, both in France and internationally. You have the means to demonstrate that our PhD program is excellent, is significant, and I wish you to keep the links with Institut Polytechnique de Paris, its laboratories, researchers, professors, friends, alumni, and I hope, obviously, you will come back to tell us what you are doing, how you are bringing solutions to the world's most important problems. In conclusion, I would simply like to reiterate my congratulations to all of you for your great achievement. And I wish you now all the best for your future career. Thank you, Rick Labay, for this wonderful introduction. And I will uh, um, call two uh, incredible professors um, that uh, we'll hear now. Um, she's a professor at Ensta Paris in the Autonomous System and uh, Robotics Laboratory of Computer Science and Systems Engineering. Uh, she was nominated as one of the 25 women in robotics you need to know about. Since 2019, she is director of the Doctoral School of IP Paris. Please give a warm applause to Dr. Adriana Tapu. And I'll also call um, um, Dr. I mean, um, Professor Francois Webb, sorry, um, he is working. Uh, in the S2A uh, research team of uh, the LTCI, is the deputy uh, director of the Adamad, uh, Adamad uh, Mathematics Graduate School. His research topics are mainly in the field of statistical signal processing and uh, statistics for uh, stochastic processes. Please give, give a warm applause to Professor Francois Rueff.
Okay. So thank you, uh, Eric, for this inspirational uh, presentation and also Lucy for the introduction. Um, so I'm really very happy uh, to be here next to with my, my colleague, uh, Francois Rueff uh, from the Adamar Doctoral School of uh, Mathematics. Um, and we would like to warmly congratulate and welcome you to the first in-person IP Paris PhD graduation ceremony. I would like to start with sincere congratulations to the 228 new doctors receiving so their doctoral degree today. We have 189 doctors from the Doctoral School of IP Paris and 39 doctors from the Adamar Doctoral School of Mathematics. Among those uh, celebrating today, so there are 60 women and 112 international PhD graduates. Of course, so today it's a celebration day, and I'm sure, and I'm seeing here in the, in the room, and uh, you are all accompanied by your family members, friends, spouses, or um, everyone that is close to you. And I'm sure that they are really very proud of everything that you have achieved and thrilled to participate in this ceremony. But if I'm looking at you as doctors right now, um, you spend a long path. You spend three or four or more years of your life working on a particular cutting edge topic. And you really succeeded to develop an innovative research and earn doctorates from IP Paris, one of the best universities in the world. I would also like to thank your families and friends that supported you uh, during so this period. And last but not least, I would like to congratulate your professors and supervisors who have supported you during so this trip and that provided you with exceptional education and helped you develop your research capabilities. But now you may wonder, you're here, and you may wonder what is different today with respect to when you started your PhD. I can tell you one thing. The first one is now people can call you doctor, even if you're not a medical doctor. Second, as a holder of a doctoral degree from IP Paris. You received the highest educational degree and you are now capable of working independently in your research topic. And last but not least, you build a strong scientific foundation and you are ready now to face new challenges in your professional life. The degree that you are receiving today from IP Paris, a world-class university. It keeps you well for your working and professional life. Just don't be afraid to explore new horizons. Be confident in your achieved capabilities and research skills that you have achieved. Never get discouraged. Always stay positive and be proud of your degree and of your alma mater, IP Paris. And to conclude, as Albert Einstein was saying, try not to become a man of success, but rather try to become a man of value. I would like to congratulate you one more time, all of you. Thank you. And to finish my uh, last introduction, I'm honored to introduce you to uh, Bechard Bazardi, um, who is a distinguished computer scientist with expertise in algorithms, web search ranking, 
natural language understanding, speech recognition, and machine learning. He leads Google Cloud Conversational AI, focusing on applying Google's latest advancements in AI to reimagine and automate customer services and operations for large enterprises. Um, Dr. Bezardi joined Google Zurich in 2006 and has played a key role in Google's AI first strategy as co-founder of the Google Assistant, Google Lens, Google Smart Display, and more recently, the next-gen assistant, a breakthrough in mobile assistance technology and on, with on-device machine learning for a lightning fast experience. Prior to that, he led several core web searches, ranking teams such as Freshness, Safe Search, and pioneered usage of entities, contexts, and machine learning in search. Today, he will uh, present uh, his work um, called Superhuman Conversational AI. AI has reached superhuman levels in various areas, such as playing um, strategic video games, calculating protein uh, folding, and visual recognition. So are we close to superhuman levels in conversational AI as well? In this talk, he will address this question, sharing some of the recent development from Google Cloud AI, Google Brain Research, DeepMind, and duplex across speech recognition and generation and natural language understanding. Please give a warm welcome to Dr. Bechard Bezardi. Thank you so much. Uh, bonjour, everyone. Hi, everyone. Uh, it's actually a big honor for me to be here. Um, this is a place that I studied many years back. Um, and uh, I did both my engineering diploma and my uh, PhD here. I have to, lots of memories from this uh, uh, particular amphitheater, so very good to be here. Um, so let's get started. I want to uh, talk about um, if the slides is connected in a second. Cool. About superhuman conversational AI. This is a, an, an area in general conversational AI that I have been working for the past many years. But the work that I'm showing in this talk is the work of many, many people and uh, from many, many different teams. So uh, as was mentioned, you know, I want to just address the problem of uh, the fact that artificial intelligence uh, has been changing lots of things in the world recently. And, uh, and you know, in many areas, artificial intelligence has been reached a level which is superior to humans. For example, when we think about image recognition in 2015, we reached a level where machines and AI can understand better what's in the image than, than the human. The error rate is lower. Uh, similarly, in the game of Go, uh, Lee Sadal, which was uh, considered to be uh, a world master who will never be beaten, uh, was finally beaten in uh, 2016 by a deep mind uh, developed AI. Um, Protein folding was a 50 years open problem, and it was believed that it will be open for the next several decades. And uh, two years ago, uh, with uh, DeepMind's uh, AlphaFold uh, AI, this problem got solved, which can be the beginning of, you know, lots of extra uh, good consequences. Now, uh, I want to talk about conversational AI. Where are we there? Has AI reached human level or higher in conversational AI? When I say superhuman uh, in the conversational AI, I could mean two things. One is um, do things that human cannot do. That would be a superhuman uh, uh, you know, level. Or second is do things that at the level of humans, but at the scale, of, uh, at the scale that human cannot do. So uh, in order to talk about these areas, I talk about three different areas, speech recognition, NLU, which is natural language understanding, and the speech uh, generation. These are the three main components of conversational AI. And I'll try to use some examples and some demos to make it uh, more fun also uh, for, uh, for, for you also. Um, so let's first start about the speech recognition. The, the truth is that the latest models built in the recent years have reached uh, the level of the word error rate, which is a measure of how good the speech recognition is, which is less than 4%. What, that's, what that means is that out of 100 words, Less than four is getting you know, misheard. 
And this is actually, you might be interested to hear that for humans, when they talk to each other, this number is between four and five. So we understand the meanings, but so there are words that, you know, we just, you know, conclude the result, the, the meanings because of, you know, not, uh, you know, um, uh, uh, from, from the context. So, so actually the number is reaching the human level. Uh, but now think about that, that other aspect of superhuman level. Now this is in 100 plus languages. This is, you know, it can automatically detect in what language is being spoken. It can do punctuation. It can do, you know, detect when there is a noisy environment, mul multiple people talking to detect one particular uh, voice of a person. Uh, so these are all, you know, the types of, the types of you know, developments which makes this, you know, makes us to be very excited and, you know, um, um, happy about where, where things are going and really, you know, science fiction levels. So I want to show two, two examples. You know, I could show really if I had time for two hours <laughs> talking about these things, but two aspects of this. So first one is a demo where it shows that how we use AI in detecting a particular voice of a speaker outside of, you know, two speakers are talking at, at the same time and two different phones tries to detect uh, exactly the voice of the person who's talking to them, but they are overlapping with each other. The second part of the demo, there is a background noise like a TV, and, uh, and again, we try to ignore that and just hear that, uh, that, uh, that particular voice. So let's play this. This is my phone. Please remember my voice. This is my phone. Please remember my voice. I'm having pasta for today. dinner tonight. I'm having Watching pasta for today. dinner tonight. Now in the different setup, there is a background which is, will be a TV, I guess. This is me speaking. Please remember my voice. Continue to watch all I of this to sweep its way through the region, tonight. and then behind this front, much cooler air will follow. Ahead of it, still on the warm side. Temperatures right now still sitting in the low 70s, 72. So, so this is actually reaching a levels where even when there's a background, you know, the, uh, the, uh, the models can actually hear better than humans. And the, the way that that has been worked is that, you know, we have been training it with, you know, throwing all different types of background noises and, you know, trying to, you know, make it, you know, learn how to hear those things, even if there is lots of different types of noise. Uh, so another example this I want is to my show, phone. Please. Sorry, um, another example I want to show is about people can have, you know, there is, uh, people are all different types of accent. And uh, sometimes, you know, they might have a speech impairment. Sometimes, you know, if you're super young or super, you know, elderly, you might have, you know, talk differently. And uh, it's very important that, you know, that speech recognition models try to understand, you know, to all different types of voices. So here is one of our colleagues actually from our speech team, uh, um, uh, which uh, you can see how our speech recognition is working for, for him. I'm Dmitry Kanievsky. I am Dmitry Kanievsky. I speak as a search scientist at Google. I am speech research scientist at Google. Before Google, I worked at IBM. Before Google, I worked at IBM. Before IBM, I worked in the Institute of Higher Mathematics. Before IBM, I worked in Institutes of Higher Mathematics. And you can, of course, see that this is super important in order that uh, the products that we are building is, you know, inclusive and so on. So now let's let's talk about one of the other uh, three uh, pictures, three uh, um, uh, parts that I showed in the beginning: speech generation. So speech generation is actually not behind uh, the speech recognition. Uh, we have reached points, uh, you know, the, the, uh, the, the uh, we, had, we have reached a point where uh, we're generating, you know, speech is very getting super, super close to the humans. So actually, to make uh, to, to demonstrate that to you, on the left hand side here, I have two voices, two columns of voices. Ignore the human and robot on the top because they are not corresponding necessarily to what, uh, wh which one is human, which one is not. So I will play two different voices and I will try to see that whether you can detect which one is human and which one is actually AI generated. 
So, um, she earned a doctorate in sociology at Columbia University. Now a second one. She earned a doctorate in sociology at Columbia University. So I can play yet another one, which is the same, the column is respecting, and then I will ask a question. George Washington was the first president of the United States. George Washington was the first president of the United States. Okay, so you can raise your hand if you think the first one, the left-hand side, is uh, the human. Okay, and uh, now who thinks that the other one is a human? Yeah, actually the first one was, uh, the first group were correct, uh, so <laughs> the, the, the direction was as it is. But, uh, but I think the main point is exactly the, this. It's actually nearly hard slash impossible to detect it. And now think about this capability now generating, you know, hundreds of different of voices in tens of languages. That is what we call it then superhuman. Another superhuman capability of a speech generation is, you know, being able to mimic and imitate someone's voice. So with the recent, you know, uh, custom models, we need only 30 minutes of training data. So this means that you hear 30 minutes of the voice of someone, you train the magic machine learning models behind, and then you generate that voice. So here is an example of a voice of a human, I need to say that, uh, original voice. According to Science Direct, a flexed posture is characterized by an increased thoracic kyphosis. And this is the voice now which is generated by just hearing 30 minutes of that from AI. Contact Center AI brings the best of Google AI to customer service. So, and so that's actually pretty exciting also. Um, now let's actually talk about, when we talk about speech generation, there's lots of other details to get right. For example, Sometimes you might have different words in the same sentence which, uh, uh, which need to get be, be pronounced differently. Let's uh, check some of those. Um, he thought it was time to present the present. Don't desert me here in the desert. Or sometimes you might have uh, words which are super complex, you know, out of the main words. Basilar membrane and otolaryngology are not autocorrelations. Or, of course, tongue twisters, which uh, is uh, hard for some humans. I mean, for me, it's always hard. Peter Piper picked a peck of pickled peppers. How many pickled peppers did Peter Piper pick? Or? She sells seashells on the seashore. The shells she sells are seashells, I'm sure. And, of course, because this is a robot, can also play faster. She sells seashells on the seashore. The shells she sells are seashells, I'm sure. And it can go faster, but it, of course it's correctly pronounced. So, uh, so that's, that's another aspect that we would call it, you know, that, that, that superhuman level. Now let's talk about the third block there, which was the natural language understanding. Here the situation is more complex. The short answer is that we have not reached the human level of understanding and being able to have conversations like humans. However, in the past five years, there has been so many, you know, breakthrough that each year we really, you know, uh, showed that, okay, the situation is much better than the year before, so that, that things are getting, you know, in much, much better shape. So the names that you see on this slide are, each of them is a breakthrough which happened over the years. I will touch on some of these in the next uh, few slides. Um, this is how things were before, uh, you know, before these five, six years, 10 years. We call it prehistoric NLU already from, you know, 10 years ago. You typically needed a number of doctors in linguistics that come together and try to actually you know, write grammars and you know, think about all different aspects of the language. And, and still, you, know, you could not necessarily cover all the complexities of human language nuances, right? And, uh, and at some point, deep learning came to the picture. And in particular, in 2017, there is this paper which is called uh, um, uh, Attention is All You Need which brought the idea of transformers. It's a new architecture which makes it possible that you can do trainings, this time with a cost which is, you know, 100x less uh, cost than before. So you can actually start to have larger models. This paper actually is number four most uh, influential paper of the uh, last five years selected by Nature. The year after that, there was another work uh, which was called BERT, this is, which is also built on transformers. And uh, the idea here is that um, uh, if you see the, what's on the right-hand side there, it is a se self-semi-supervised uh, system which basically takes paragraphs and removes parts of the paragraphs and tries to predict it. And now imagine that the system is doing that with, with the, all of the paragraphs of all of the web 
all the time, continuously. So it actually tries to learn lots of things from the language by just trying to predict what's, what's missing. Um, and this is you know, a result of all of this in the next generation in 2020 was MENA, which is uh, the closest you get uh, for, uh, from, uh, from the uh, humanness point of view in some sense, sensibility and specific specificity of the answers. So the red one on this, uh, the red column here is uh, uh, MENA and, and blue is human. So this is roughly giving you an idea of how, uh, how close this is getting. And these are open domain chatbots, which basically means that you start chatting with them about any topic that you want. Um, now, a version of that the year after Lambda was developed where, uh, which had this particular, you know, nice property where you can actually ask it to role play a particular, you know, uh, thing. So here we are showing uh, the, um, how Lambda can role play, um, uh, can, can role play, you know, Pluto, for example. Again, this is, there is not, no one going to write any rule. This is very important. This is all automatically learned. So let's see how that conversation is going on. Let's listen to a conversation the team had with Pluto a few days ago. I'm so curious about you. I sense your excitement. Ask me anything. Tell me what I would see if I visited. You would get to see a massive canyon, some frozen icebergs, geysers, and some craters. It sounds beautiful. I assure you it is worth the trip. However, you need to bring your coat because it gets really cold. I'll keep that in mind. Hey, I was wondering, have you ever had any visitors? Yes, I have had some. The most notable was New Horizons, the spacecraft that visited me. That must have been exciting. The team that created New Horizons was very excited to see me. I also sent them back a picture of myself since I had not been seen up close before. That's so great. What else do you wish people knew about you? I wish people knew that I am not just a random ice ball. I am actually a beautiful planet. Well, I think you're beautiful. I am glad to hear that. I don't get the recognition I deserve. Sometimes people refer to me as just a dwarf planet. So you can Let's see that listen to a this, this conversation actually can go for half an hour, hour. It will just continue talking. And it actually, when you listen to it, it actually makes sense. It's not just about facts, but it tries to keep the conversation. Sometimes they are quite talkative and so on. And now the latest, latest, uh, uh, you know, versions of innovations that we have had on natural language understanding is this thing we call it PALM, Pathway Language Models. It's a new architecture which enables us also to, you know, expand, you know, these large language models. We need to come up with a new name for it because now this is really extra large language model. This is 540 billion parameters uh, model, which for, for the ones among you who, uh, who, who, who know the parameters uh, of machine learning, and which is basically now starting to, um, to be able to beat humans on many, average humans on many average, uh, on many average, on many uh, conversational tasks. There is, you know, across hundreds of different tasks that this comparison is happening, I just showed two or three of them. First of all, it can explain a joke. So imagine that the task here is the following. You give a task, you give a joke, to the, to the model, and again, the model has not been trained to explain jokes. It's just a, it's a, just a huge model, you know, that's which everything is inside it, right? Which now it can explain jokes, you know, why, and then you ask basically why this is funny, and it, you know, goes step by step trying to uh, explain jokes. Of course, it's a joke killer, but, um, uh, uh, but uh, it's good for some people like myself that sometimes don't get the jokes, why they're funny. Um, or, uh, you know, chain of thought prompting. Chain of thought prompting is actually something which is quite complex to be able to explain why a solution of something is so. And, uh, and this was uh, supposed to be reasonably, you know, because it's about reasoning and it's about, you know, uh, being able to, you know, not only solve a problem, uh, the statement that you see, but also step by step say what's happening. And that's also, you know, a problem is capable of, capable of doing that. Similarly, counterfactual. That's another thing which is pretty human, or was supposed to be pretty human, which is counterfactual means something which has not happened, but it might have happened. And, and then using that in the reasoning, it's very, you know, complex thing, but again, Palm is now capable of doing that. Now, these were, you know, again, we can talk about these things for hours and hours, but these were some of the very main, you know, setups, main, main developments which has been happening across the speech. 
generation, a speech you know, uh, a recognition, and natural language understanding. Now I want to show that how some of all of these come together, not all of them, but some other parts of it comes together with, in our conversational AI duplex bots, which, uh, which we have built a first version of that few years back, and it has been improving. During the COVID, you know, Google actually uses this conversational AI bot to call organizations to check the opening hours, whether they have been changing or not. So let's uh, hear one of those conversations. This is my last uh, uh, demos. Townsend Pharmacy, how can I help you? Hello? Yes. Sorry, I need to precise something first. You hear two voice, um, a lady and a, a, male, a female and a male person. The male person is not a human. Just I needed to uh, re remind you that. Townsend Pharmacy, how can I help you? Hello? Yes. Hey, I'm calling from Google Maps. Uh, given the current health situation, I just wanted to update your hours. I'm an automated service, so this call is recorded to improve Google services. Could you please tell me your opening and closing hours throughout the week? Do you want the hours for the store or the pharmacy? I was hoping to get the hours for the pharmacy. Okay, so Monday through Friday is 8.30 to 4 p.m. Mm-hmm. And then during the weekend, give me, mm -hmm. let me just double check, okay? I know mm -hmm. Sundays we are closed. Um, okay. And one moment. Okay, so Saturdays it's 9.30 to 1 currently. Sorry, let me repeat all the hours back. Monday through Friday from 8.30 a.m. to 4 p.m. Yes. Saturday from 9.30 a.m. to 1 p.m.? Yes. Sunday you're closed, is that correct? Correct. Okay, got it. Thank you for your time. All Goodbye. right, no problem. Bye-bye. And, um, and this is some of the reactions. For a client, um, for Friday the 17th. Confirmar a que hora abre mi tierra no the direct number to reach Buffalo Wild Wings. Quería confirmar a qué hora abre mi tierra no hay. I'm calling from Google to verify your business name and address. Uh, I was calling to find out your business hours for today. Uh, today, because it is Saturday, uh, sorry, it is Friday, so I got my days mixed up. Um, Friday, we open at 8 and close at 8, or open at 6. Well, my days are all off. That's why we'll it's hard. open at 7 and close at 8. Okay, got it. Thank you for your time. Wow, you got it. It's amazing what an automated system can do. Hey, thank you, Google Assistant. So nice to talk to you. Awesome. This is so, like, I feel like I'm in the future. You're awesome, Google. I love you. You're like the smartest computer I ever talked to. All right, cool. Thanks. Have a good night. Thanks. You're the best robot I've ever met. Okay, this is very smart. You're the most awesome automated person ever. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you, robot. Your job is completed. <laughs> okay. So, uh, just a couple of words about me and just PhD uh, before finishing this. Uh, this is my. I think it was. I was presented. Thank you. And uh, you covered. I guess most of this. Uh, but 20 years ago, I studied here as an engineer. I did my PhD also later here, um, which I, when I was counting it and it felt 20 years ago I was doing engineer here, felt you know too long in the past. But uh, uh, and from, 20, from 2006, I was at Google, uh, so I actually did my research and postdoc and moved to Google. And a month or two after joining Google, I wanted to leave Google because I felt that it's not researchy enough. But then I talked to my leadership, and I ended up, you know, being on a web, starting to work on web search ranking, which felt actually lots of algorithmics, which was what I was passionate about. And then later on, I started to, you know, a number of projects, uh, uh, which was mostly about future of search, uh, and most namely, you know, Google Assistant and Google Lens. Um, what, what I want to say is, uh, finish my talk is, and this is a picture from those good old days uh, here. Um, uh, it actually, the picture is for during my PhD, I was trying to see whether I still fit my, uh, my uniform, uh, uh, my engineering uniform. And uh, on the right hand side is actually when, uh, when I was for the first time talking about the idea of Google Lens to, to Sundar, our CEO. 
So what I want to say is that this is an important day for all of you today, but uh, it's really a beginning of a journey. So it's, the journey is all in the future also. You have learned important things in the past four years, and, uh, and many of those things will actually really be useful for you and helpful. It has been my case that many of the learnings that I have had for a PhD during a PhD has been, I have been applying it you know, during my, my career in the past you know, uh, 16, 17 years after, after my PhD. There's a couple of them which is you know, really important for me. Number one is that there is no magic, magic silver bullet. So when you want to do something, it takes time. You need to try hard for it. It takes time. You need to iterate on it. You know, every day you solve a part of it. It's not true that we sit and wait for that one big magic idea to come. All the big innovations, all the things which has, or nearly all the big innovations which have been happening is a result of you try to go in a direction and you try to step by step, try to do a little bit, you know, every day and consistently try hard and to go in that direction. And at some point, you look back and see that the result is, you know, getting, you know, you're getting where you want it to be. So this is, I think, one, something very important. You often failed before succeeding. I'm sure all of you, I mean, I have, or most of you, maybe not all, have had rejected papers. And then over time, you change that paper, and then it got accepted or publication, you know, for the journal or a conference. And that actually applies in all your life in the future also. When you start working on a product or a project or an industry or research, you start again, will fail again. But those failures are things that you learn from, and it's very important to actually, you know, keep, you know, keep motivated in that, that journey. The second thing I want to say, apart from the after journey, is, uh, which was also touched on before, is about teamwork and collaboration. It's very, very important to think about team levels and working, you know, collaborating. Again, during the PhD, I learned to collaborate with some of the collaboration, you know, my collaborators and, and my supervisors, of course. But, but after that, you know, I saw that how much more important was it. Everything I showed here, these are the works of, you know, maybe 1,000 people, which I have interacted with many, many of them closely, but, uh, but it's really impossible at, uh, today if you want to do something very big that you do it alone. You have to have a strong team, connected team, passionate team that work you know, all together to, to get that done. And, and this is a thing that, again, during the PhD we learn, and actually after PhD it's, it's even more. The third thing I want to say is uh, about thinking big. One thing that I have learned actually even more af after Google is that this thing that we call it like 10x thinking. When you want to, uh, uh, what, what that means is that when you want to improve something, don't think about improving it 10%. Just uh, put a larger goal, you know, put 10x, you know, say that how can I solve a 10x or 100x this? The, the, the effect that that will have is that not necessarily you will reach that 100x or 10x, but you will actually make the decisions which makes you reach more than that 10% which you were you know, shooting in the beginning for. So, so really think, uh, think bigger uh, for, you know, don't wait for the big magic, but think big. These are, these are two, two things. And the last but not least, I think it's very important to have fun. I think um, uh, both during my PhD and in the past, you know, post-PhD, I have been always passionate about what I have been doing, and I think that has, be, that has a big, big effect on, you know, making you becoming, you know, more productive and hopefully more successful. So uh, please continue, uh, you know, um, uh, to do something which makes you happy and uh, is fun for you. Uh, from deep my heart, I want to congratulate all of the doctors in the room. Thank you for having me. Thank you, Beshad, for this inspiring presentation that I'm sure that it was very much appreciated um, by all the doctors, faculty, researchers, and family members, and everyone here in uh, the room. And now, let uh, the graduation ceremony begin. I will invite the scientific coordinators to come on the stage they will hand you the graduation stoles. These are Benjamin Doer for computer science, data, and artificial intelligence. Abibu Metournan for engineering, mechanics, and energy. Lirida Navine for information, communication, electronics. 
Nicolas David. For biology, Cédric Tard. For chemistry, Nicolas Motis. For economics, management, and social sciences, and Matthew Nguyen. For physics. Elo Adja, Mohamed Ahmed Mohamed, Licia Amishi, Anas Barakat, Antoine Bernard. Matteo Bertolino, Martin Bir, Kathleen Blanchet, Safa Boudabou, Dia Bouglegan. Thomas Buffet, Georgia Cantisani, Chao Tsao, Florence Carton, Hugo Cazel Dupré. Martina Cerulli, Émile Chapuis, Mathilde Chenu de la Morinerie, Andrej Sivka, Pierre Colombo. Raphaël Costa, Vincent Couteau, Luciano Di Palma, Douglas Do Couto Texera, Mohamed Dridi. Antoine Durand, Marois Eulush, Natasha Fernandez, Simon Forest, Tuanir Franza Redende. Enguerrand Jinté, Amna Garbi, Pawel Gouzevitz, Mohamed Awari. Isham Oseni
Enrui Huang, Karim Magdi Ibrahim, Gabriel Yomazo, Jonathan Lajus, Alex Lambert. Miko Leberle, Alexis Lescoué, Franklin Lecam Laco, Thiali Liu, Paul Marionnet. Yulia Mitrika, Marzier Mozafari, Kimia Najai, Antoli Nazrala, Tanue Nguyen. Tuan An Nguyen, Isabella Panaccione, Naït Pawar, Antoine Pirovano, Yang Chu Marie-Julie Rakoto Sauna Julian Ritter Flavia Salutari Kilian Schulz Forster Mariana Segovia Ferreira Mustafizur Rahman Shahid, Gokran Chang, Andrea Vaglio, Adrien Guillon, Chanmin Wu. Huating Yao, Iba Youssef, Chuang Yu, Khaled Zaouk, Mesam Zou. For Engineering, Mechanics and Energy, Professor Abibou Maitonan. Filippo Agnelli, Luca Benoît Maréchal, Tobias Boll, Ayatala Bouramdan, David de Souza. Anna Isabelle Delval Benitez, Nan Deng, Claire De Salle, Mathieu Donio, Catherine Disdal, Ovin Ellingsen, Camille Guevenou, Quentin Guyos, Kevin Ha. Nicolas Anapier. Janavi Cantaraju. Rémi Lapère. Arthur Legal. Mathieu Lugrin. Svetlana Petrenko. Goshun Chin, Nicole Roselli, Yichang Shen, Sakina Takash, Johan Tellier. Felipe Toledo Bittner, Nicolas Trafni, Tulio Traverso, Nicole Tueni. Arnold Joachim
Information, Communications and Electronics, Professor Lirida Naviné. Emric Arnold Emen Askri KBD Tesema Atra Wei Cheng Benjamin Dauphin Bo Chang Dong Sylvain Ferrand Bader Mustafa Fetouri Arthur Louchard Sofiane Takarabt Walid Trabelsi Nilesh Bias Shuetsan Yang Zhe Ye And now, I would like to invite on the stage Camelia Dodell, former PhD student from Adamar Dorto School of Mathematics, and Arthur Boutillon, former PhD student of Doctor School of IP Paris. They will both share with us why did they pursue their studies with a PhD thesis, and how was their life in the lab and on campus as a doctoral student. Thank you. So, hello everyone. Um, I'm very happy to be here and thankful to Adriana for the introduction. So we've been given sort of the task of, you know, sharing our experience about the uh, PhD and I thought about it in um, trying to understand uh, two main questions. First of all, why the PhD and then how did I somehow made it through it? So starting with the why, well, it turns out that like fast paced exams have never really been my thing. So I had long been curious about research. I wanted to be in an environment where I had time to try out new ideas and I could write them down using a coherent narrative. So this drove me kind of in the research path. From there, uh, Francois Rueff, which you've met, uh, gave me the opportunity to do a PhD under his supervision. And I am really, really grateful uh, to him for believing in me um, at a time where I was at the start of my journey and if I'm being really honest, uh, despite some of my not so glorious uh, marks at the time. So that's kinda, kinda about the why, and now regarding the how, well I think, and like it was said before, there's no real miracle, so it's mainly blood, sweat, and tears throughout the three years, and I'm pretty sure most of us agree with that, but I think it's important to recognize the fact that it's not limited to that, right? Because 
Um, in my case, I've been very fortunate um, in terms of supervision, so I've mentioned Francois, but I also want to give a shout out to my other um, main PhD advisor, Randall Duke, which is also from IP Paris, is from like Telecom Sud Paris. Um, when I arrived, I didn't have that much confidence in myself or in my research abilities, and I could see changes um, happening, you know, this confidence going up throughout my PhD, and I think uh, it's thanks to their invaluable support, so I'm very grateful for that. I also want to thank my department at Telecom Paris, both from the research side, but also the administration, and more generally, by like all those people that are involved in making this PhD process, which can be quite grueling, uh, easier. Um, so those are like a lot of thanks, but there's one thank I'm not gonna give. So I'm not thanking COVID for, you know, the past few years and all those online or canceled conferences, talks, seminars and everything. But as I reflect back, um, at the end of the day, I realized that I've been among the lucky few because I was able to carry on business as usual. I could do my research, so I'm very like, grateful for that too. Um, now I'm off to new challenges um, as a postdoc at the University of Oxford, and my time as a PhD student at Telecom Paris, Institut Polytechnique de Paris, uh, made me more than ready for them. So thanks a lot for your attention, and happy graduation day to all of us. I'm now hand over to Arthur. Thank you very much. Thank you, Camilla. Thank you, Alejandra uh, Tapus, for the introduction. So, yeah, we were asked to give a small speech about our experience, uh, in my case, here at uh, Ecole Doctorale Institut Polytechnique Paris. So, basically, I started my PhD in 2017. So, Institut Paris, uh, Polytechnique de Paris did not even exist at that time. Back then, our team, that is Nicolas David, whom you also met, and I, uh, just arrived from Ecole Normale Supérieure to join the Laboratory for Optics and Bioscience here in Ecole Polytechnique. Um, upon the creation of the Institute, which was uh, a bit chaotic at the beginning, I joined uh, the doctoral school and became uh, a full member of the Institut Polytechnique de Paris. I must say, I really enjoy my stay here at Ecole Polytechnique. Although this school is a real maze, there is, there is always something going on here, be it scientific discussions, food being served for the election of the case, amazing spectacle of the Binet Broadway, but also activities given by the Institut Polytechnique de Paris. Indeed, life here on the Plateau de Saclay is really enjoyable, even as a researcher. Concerning science, well, biology, my domain of expertise, is not the main focus of Institut Polytechnique de Paris. Still, I managed to find my way here. Conferences were organized, and I could build several collaborations with other labs interested in biology, like the BIOC and the LADIX. I benefited from the equipment of the lab here, the supervision, the administrative support, uh, the savoir-faire, but also, and perhaps most importantly, the comradeship of students, postdocs, researchers, administrative, and so on. This was particularly important during these difficult times of the pandemics. Finally, and I'm really grateful for that, I was given the opportunity to train young students from the Bachelor of Ecole Polytechnique. And although they mostly have courses in informatics, physics, and mathematics, I must say that we managed to debauch some of them into following a biology courses. Um, of course, uh, I couldn't stop academic research after having such a nice time here doing my PhD, although life is not bright every day for a PhD student. Now I joined the newly founded Physics of Life Institute in Dresden, Germany, as a postdoctoral researcher. And who knows, perhaps soon I could claim uh, a full academic researcher position. And I really thank Institut Polytechnique de Paris for supervision and giving me the opportunity to make a PhD here and you for your attention. Have a nice graduation day. Thank you for this 
uh, nice both testimonies. I think it's really very important. And right now, so we're going to pursue uh, with the next three scientific domains. So I will invite now on the stage Nicola David, scientific coordinator for biology and chemistry. For economics, management, and social science, Professor Nicola Motis. Melissa Alloz, Dorian Astor, Robin Bas Batard, Mathieu Battistelli, Vincent Boucher. Antoine Ferré, Lucas Girard, Vincent Gorgue, Morgane Guignard, Robin Héron. Alexis Larousse. Raphaël Lé. Bérangère Pateau. Fabien Pérez. Pierre Poinsignon. Adrien Raisonville, Anna Rewakowicz, Julie Saakian, Émilie Sartre, Haruki Sawamura. For physics, Professor Mathieu Nguyen. Gewa Akiki, Medine Ali Sherif, Robert Benda, Mike Boer, Matteo Bonanomi. Good 
Bin Cho, Alice Kofani, Thibaut Kudarche, Rotsislav Danilo, Perceval Desforges. Anatole Destieu, Chen Yang Ding, Ting Wei Dong, Eslam El Shami, Alice Fabas. Guillaume Falmagne, Julia Ferrer Hortas, Felipe Garcia Rosales, Tiengmo Kim, Mingtin Kim. Philippe Willem Klein, Julien Layani, Simone Lantéan, Andung Le, Tevi Locke. Stefano Mazei, Karim Medjoubi, Ambra Morana, Jacques Muller, Eric Ngo. Anen Weslati, Georgie Pokorowski, Chalu Rani, Clotilde Raoult, Pablo San Miguel. Marcello Tortulici, Louis Villa, Weisi Wang, Tinhui Chang, Xiang Chao. Hi again, now it's time to call the doctors of the Hadamar Doctoral School in Mathematics, and I'm the one in charge. Bastien Baldacci, Clément Beneteau, Linda Chamac, Damien Chico. Alexis Cousin, Benoît Dagalier, Camélia Dodel, Vianney de Bavelair, Julien de Persin. Ruben Di Battista, Etem Farat, Louis Fauri, Joao Felicio Dosres, Nidal Gamoudi. Nidam Gazaniadou, Maxime Grangero, Luca Isidoritz, Hicham Janati, Avetik Garagulian. Corentin Laroche, P. 
Pierre Lavigne, Frédéric Loge, Agère Metteni, Marianne Morel. Felipe Munoz Hernandez, François-Pierre Paty, Mathieu Piquerez, Pratic Rai, Édouard Rousseau. Omar Sadi, Achille Salon, Nicolas Schroeder, Josué Chuanti Fotso, Laura Tinsi. Cheikh Saliou Touré, Julie Tournière, Constantinos Varelas, Su Yuen. And now, so I'm going to speak about something very important. So maybe you heard it already. So IP Paris awards annually, so the best thesis award to the students who have produced so the best PhD thesis and made the most outstanding contribution. So this year we received more than 50 applications, all of them of high quality. So, to be honest, so the jury had a hard time to deliberate. And this year, we have seven ex awards. So the awardees are in alphabetical order. Arthur Boutillon, for his thesis entitled Analysis of Cell Movement Coordination Mechanism in the Axial Mesoderm During Gastrulation of the zebrafish Daniel Rario. <laughs> Camelia Dodel for her thesis entitled Adaptative Monte Carlo Methods for Complex Models. <laughs> Claire Dessal for her thesis entitled Forces in a microvessel on chip system development, poroelasticity mechanics, and cellular response. <laughs> Bo Zhang Dong for his thesis entitled Quantum Dot Lasers on Silicon Nonlinear Properties, Dynamics, and Applications. Guillaume Falmani for his thesis entitled The BC Plus Messon in Heavy Ion Collisions with a CMS Detector. <laughs> Antoine Ferret for his thesis entitled Essays on the Design of Tax Benefit Systems. <laughs> and Kimia Najaji for her thesis entitled Slide Wasserstein Distance for Large-Scale Machine Learning. Congratulations to all of you. So, each of you and each of them so will present their thesis in 180 seconds. Unfortunately, we have three of them that could not come here and be here with us today. So Bo Zhang Dong, Guillaume Falmani, and Antoine Ferret, so they are already uh, in their uh, postdoc, doing their postdoc research abroad, that, so they couldn't be here today, but they send us a video. So let's start with Claire Dessal.
Okay, so good evening, everyone, and uh, thank you for this uh, honor and for the uh, great graduation ceremony. So uh, I did my PhD on a um, microvessel on chip, and I will briefly present today the work that I did. Uh, so the system that I was interested in was the human vasculature, and the human vasculature is an extremely complex organ, as you can appreciate in these two uh, casting and um, simulated images that runs throughout your body with a very particular architecture. I was in particular interested in the role of the forces that are present in the vasculature in regulating and controlling the behavior of endothelial cells. So you have contact-derived stresses from the surface that the cells lie on, but you also have flow-derived stresses, hence the fact that I'm in the uh, mechanics, fluid mechanics uh, domain, and these were the forces that I was interested in. So in particular, the shear stress, the viscous friction of the blood on the cells, the pressure, and the tensile stresses that come from the deformation of the vessels due to pressure. Uh, to study this, I developed an organ on chip, which are very useful in reach a system that mimics the complexity of the native environment, thanks to a combination of different aspects, and allow us to study, in particular, the role of mechanical stimulations. Uh, so the system that I developed is a microvessel on chip that you can see here, uh, the schematics on the left. You can uh, create this microvessel lined with cells, push fluid through it to generate both shear stress and deformations. So this is what it looks like in fluorescent imaging. You can see the nice covering of cells, as you can appreciate on the left with their cytoskeleton in green, and on the right, their junctions in red. So the first task that I did was to characterize, oops, sorry, the, can I go back? I think it does not go back. Okay, so I characterized the mechanical forces that you can have in the system. So the shear stress to make sure that we were covering the relevant range that you have in your body, but also the stretch and the ability to do this in a pulsatile mode, as you would have seen in the previous slide if I was better with this uh, remote. I also explored possibilities to vary the coupling between the shear stress and the stretch by changing the resistance, the concentration of the gel, and other important parameters in the system. Um, finally, once you have a system, it's nice to use it for something. So I decided to investigate one force in particular because I had only one year left in my PhD, which was the response of cells to a pressure step as this is much less studied than the role of shear stress. So the experiment is very simple. You impose a pressure step and you see how the cells respond. And to do this, we use a hydrostatic pressure. So this looks very fancy and complicated, but in reality, this is uh, what my experiment looks like. Uh, and I actually have to import the plastic straw from uh, Spain because they're now banned in France. Uh, and when you do this, you can see a drastic remodeling of the cells lining the vessel. As you can see here on the right, after seven hours of high pressure, you have reorganization of the monolayer, changes in the shape, the nucleus, but also the cytoskeleton of the cells, which are very important for their function, as shape and function are linked in uh, biology. Uh, one interesting structure uh, for us French people <laughs> was uh, the transendothelial stress fiber that you can see that form uh, in this circumferential arrangement very reminiscent of the metal that you have around the wine barrel uh, that are there to enable the uh, mechanical resistance of the structure to compensate the inside pressure. So after this very brief overview, I want to acknowledge uh, all the people that helped me during my PhD and all my collaborators, including Arthur, who's here, and thank you very much for your attention. So thank you for this uh, presentation. So now we will watch uh, the video of Bozang Dong. Hello everyone, my name is Bozang Dong. It is my great honor to receive the best thesis award from Yibei Bahi this year. And I also acknowledge the uh, opportunity to shortly present my uh, PhD work. Uh, my PhD thesis is focused on the development of high performance quantum dot lasers for silicon photonic integrated circuits. So first of all, why silicon photonics? Because compared to the small size uh, gallium arsenide with Indian phosphide vapor, the 300 millimeter silicon vapor has several advantages. First of all, it allows for largely increasing the volume for the photonic component, 
thus we can largely reduce the cost of a single chip. Also, it offers a very low low sleep guide uh, chip substrate, the most advanced CMOS processing and packaging. And also it allows for the 3D electronic and photonic integration. However, there are still some challenges in silicon photonic integrated circuits, and most of them comes from the laser source. For example, the chip scale back reflections can easily uh, destabilize your laser source and make your signal very uh, difficult to be identified. Also, if you want to generate an optical frequency comb to improve the transmission capacity, uh, if you use an optical pump, the uh, power conversion efficiency could be quite low. Also, we want to uh, extend the functionality of silicon platform uh, to the uh, integration of quantum technologies. And in my thesis, I demonstrate that the quantum dot laser could be a very promising solution for this application. First of all, the quantum dot laser is very tolerant for the chip scale back reflections. In experiment, we demonstrated that the uh, feedback insensitivity of quantum dot laser is more than 15 dB higher than the IEEE standard. This is a really great news for the development of uh, uh, isolator-free photonic integrated circuits. Also, if we use the quantum dot laser to generate optical frequency comb by using the passive mode locking or self mode locking technology, uh, the energy efficiency uh, would be much higher. However, this kind of comb source could be very noisy, but we can consider to use the optical feedback or the optical injection to reduce its phase noise and to improve its optical bandwidth. And most importantly, uh, in both theory and experiment, we demonstrate that the four-way mixing efficiency of quantum dot laser is more than 100 times higher than that of conventional uh, quantum wheel laser. That gives insights for the, for the generation of quantum states of light by using the quantum dot laser. I'm now working at, uh, as a postdoc scholar at the University of California, Santa Barbara in the US. We do believe that the photonics will be the future of our data life, and uh, we're trying to make it into reality. In the end, I would like to acknowledge uh, my supervisor, my colleagues, and my collaborators. Uh, this work can never be done without them. And I, I would like to also uh, to uh, thank you for your attention. So now I would like to invite Camelia Dodel. So the floor is yours. Okay, so I'm very jealous of the previous slide talks because they had plenty of nice pictures. Um, unfortunately, mine will only have one slide. For some reason, I wanted to keep everything condensed. Don't really ask me why. So my PhD was entitled Adaptive Monte Carlo Methods for Complex Models. I've done it um, in Telecom Paris, and it lives in the realm of Bayesian inference. So basically, in Bayesian inference, you've got a model, a phenomenon, given some data by taking into account, oh, I actually can't see what's written there, so I'll look here. Uh, while taking into account prior knowledge on the model parameter. Nowadays, those models are becoming increasingly com more complicated, which is due to the fact that you've got a lot of available data and you need complex models to model them. This uh, leads to uh, complex uh, pursuit densities and Bayesian inference tasks want to use this complex pursuit densities and it now becomes uh, intractable. You cannot use it anymore, so you need to approximate it. You've got several ways to try to approximate this complex pursuit densities and in my PhD, I've been interested in one particular class of methods which are called varsional inference methods. So what are these varsional inference methods about? Well, what they do is they try to approximate this complex pursuit density by a simpler pursuit density, which will have two, let's say, main properties. The first property is that, like I was say, it will belong to a simpler family of probability densities. You want to be able to use it, so you need something that is simpler. 
Secondly, it will be defined as a minimizer. It will minimize the approximation error within your family. So you've got a very big family, and then you want to find the posterior dens the, the density, the target, the density that will minimize that error. Written like this, you will understand that there are two important things. The first important thing is how do I define my approximating family? I want to, it to be large enough so that I can capture like complexity within my posterior density. Yet, I want to be able to solve my minimization problem. I want to be able to minimize my approximation error. So from there, you have to think about your approximating family and how you define your approximation error. Um, in the traditional literature, this has been done um, in a way, but we found that there are some limitations. So my work in my PhD was about trying to enlarge the possibilities we had in variational inference. Namely, we wanted to propose algorithms, adaptive algorithms, so iterative algorithms, that would have um, the properties I'm going to list now. First of all, we wanted to enrich, to make this variational family, this Q, bigger, um, larger than what is usually considered in variational inference. This is to obtain better and per core performances. Secondly, we wanted to be able to work with different type of way to measure this approximation error beyond what is usually considered, which we've done by using the alpha divergence. I don't really want to bore you with the detail, but it's an interesting uh, way to measure the approximation error that can bypass some difficulties in variational inference. So we've done that, and if I can, yeah. Uh, go to the next one. We've done that in a way that is theoretically sound, which is something that is sometimes very hard to do in variational inference and also numerically advantages. Again, I'm sweeping a lot of stuff under the rug, but the theoretical part is really, really interesting in my opinion. Um, lastly, and I think this might be the most fascinating part of my PhD for me, we've been able to build bridges between different approaches in the literature. So I've written them down again, if you might be familiar with the domain, but, you know, great and decent, entropic, mirror decent, integrated EM, we found that there are some connections and some links that were not seen before and then can improve on those variational inference methods. Thanks a lot for listening to me. Um, here's a bit of you know, research outcomes. Uh, two um, published uh, papers, a journal one and a conference one, and one that is still in the review process, a journal paper. Thanks a lot for your attention. Thank you for this presentation. It was very dense. <laughs> and now we will uh, watch uh, the video of Guillaume Falmani. Thousands of billions of degrees. That was the temperature of the universe a few microseconds after the Big Bang. At this temperature, the quarks and gluons that are usually bound in the atomic nuclei can suddenly move freely in a so-called quark-gluon plasma. This deconfined state might exist in neutron stars, but can also be reproduced in high energy collisions of heavy ions, such as those taking place in the CMS detector at the LHC accelerator. So I used data from CMS, this 14,000 ton beast, to study the BC meson composed of a beauty and a charm quark. But charm quarks are so numerous and mobile in lead lead collisions at LHC that they can recombine with a beauty quark to produce a BC. As the BC is rarely produced in the vacuum of proton-proton collisions, recombination might compensate dissociation and energy loss processes, which could be revealed by a large RAA, namely the ratio of production yields in lead-lead and proton-proton collisions. The BC was studied in proton-proton, but never in heavy ion collisions. So this is what this thesis achieved, thanks to the many elements shown in this flowchart. The main challenge was to discriminate the signature of three displaced muons against the background in a very busy environment. So for this, I applied a cut selection and I traded a BDT, which is a, a machine learning uh, uh, technique. Then I ran a template fit on the non-peaking trimuon mass shown in PP on top and in lead lead uh, on the bottom and in BDT bins from background enriched on the left to signal enriched on the right. 
The signal is in blue and it shows clearly in the purest bins on the right. So this constitutes the first observation of BC in uh, heavy ion collisions. The correction of the observed yield for the detector acceptance and the selection efficiency uses a simulation, but it had to be iteratively corrected with preliminary measured uh, distributions. This is the resulting lead lead to PP ratio uh, on the left uh, versus the transverse momentum uh, PT and on the right versus the centrality of the collision, which is basically its activity. BC mesons are less suppressed uh, than most other uh, quark bound states which points to recombination processes. So this results really opens the way to the use of BC as a new probe of the quark gluon plasma. I also did phenomenology on the radiative energy loss of quarks and gluons in the plasma. Uh, I have shown its universality in more than 60 measurements of the high momentum modification of particles in various systems. I confirmed that this modification scales with a single variable, variable namely the PT divided by the energy loss scale epsilon. So I fitted this scale, uh, this uh, energy loss value in each data set, and now using also the particle multiplicity and uh, the path lengths and the transverse area that I calculated uh, for each, um, for each uh, system, um, I set forth a second scaling law relating the energy loss to the density and geometry uh, of each system. And this fit constrains the medium properties, in particular the exponent alpha is found consistent with the longitudinal medium expansion. Thank you very much. That was really very complicated. <laughs> um, so now I will invite Kimia here on the stage. Okay, hello everyone. Uh, first of all, congratulations to all of you for your PhD, and thank you to the jury for this award. I will present my PhD, which is on a specific object called slight positive line distance for machine learning applications. <laughs> okay, here we go. So, Machine learning referred to modern artificial intelligence algorithms, which learn from data in order to make decisions. And one popular application nowadays is image generation. Generative algorithms take as, is, as inputs observed data, for example, images of cats, and the goal is to reproduce new images of cats. So this cat here on the right doesn't exist in real life. It was created by an algorithm whose role was to mimic best images of cats that they observe. And to do this, the algorithm needed to measure how similar the generative image is compared to uh, the observed data. In order to compare two data sets, modern machine learning algorithms usually represent the data according to the way they are distributed and measure the similarity between their priority distributions with a priority metric, here denoted by D. So basically, the smaller d mu nu, the more similar mu and nu. I focused during my PhD thesis on the slide was line distance, which was introduced in 2009 as a way to efficiently compare two high-dimensional distributions. Because of these computational benefits, uh, slide was line distance has been successfully deployed in various applications. But when I started my PhD, the theoretical properties of that metric were not fully understood, so that restricted the analysis of such algorithms. So the broad objective of my thesis was to pro provide an in-depth study of that metric in order to unlock its full potential on modern machine learning problems. So as a first contribution, we provided a more comprehensive theoretical study. From a high-level perspective, our results showed that um, algorithms based on the cyber distance perform well, including uh, generative models. They explain why it performs well in practice especially in high dimensional cases. Then we developed a new methodology based on that metric 
for making inferences. So we expanded the scope of application of that metric, and for example, we used it to remove the image from noise. Our method is theoretically justified, thanks to our theoretical analysis, and it is easier to parameterize as compared to the state of the art. Finally, our contribution showed that the cyber social indecent suffer from a main limitation, which is that the usual way to compute it relies on a parameter that is difficult to tune. So we propose two solutions. The first one is a non-parametric and theoretically grounded method to estimate the cyber social distance. And the second one is the introduction of new priority metrics, which are all inspired by the concepts behind the cyber social distance. And in both cases, we showed that our solution help reduce the computational time of generative models based on the cyber social distance or improve the quality of images. Finally, I would like to thank my PhD supervisors, Roland Bado, Alain Durmus, and Umut Shimshakli, and all the collaborators whose names are printed here. Thank you for your attention, and please celebrate well with graduation. Thank you for this very nice presentation. And now we will watch the video of Antoine Ferry. Hello, my name is Antoine Ferry, and I graduated last year from a PhD in economics at Crest in Ecole Polytechnique. I am delighted to be one of the 2022 IP Paris Best Thesis Awards. And for this, I would really like to thank all members of the jury as well as all members of Crest and Ecole Polytechnique, and more specifically my supervisors, Pierre Boyer and Jean-Baptiste Michaud, for their support throughout my PhD. Thanks to this support, I was able to visit UC Berkeley during my dissertation, and for this I would really like to thank Emmanuel Saez, who welcomed me there, as well as Dimitri Tobinsky, with whom I started collaborating. My dissertation is entitled Essays on the Design of Tax Benefit Systems. It's a dissertation in public economics, which is the field of economics that analyzes government policies, and in this dissertation specifically, the design of taxes and transfers. The first chapter is a descriptive analysis of the French tax benefit system, where I used micro simulations to understand exactly how the different taxes and transfers interact to form the aggregate budgets of the individuals. One thing that really struck me in this descriptive work is the complexity of the tax transfer system. And so in the second chapter, I started working on how agents, that is people's inattention to taxes, can interact with the conduct of tax policy and the design of those taxes and transfers. In the third chapter, Realizing that redistribution in practice operates through different taxes and transfers, I started characterizing the optimal nonlinear tax systems, that is, the optimal different types of taxes and transfers that aim to achieve redistribution in a given tax and transfer system. Last, I analyzed the interactions between redistribution and unemployment insurance. That is very often, one would study optimal redistribution separately from optimal unemployment insurance. What I show in this last chapter is that redistribution and unemployment insurance problems are connected and interact in ways that have important implications for the design of tax benefit system. This was a very short summary of my PhD dissertation, and if you're interested, I would be very happy to talk. Thank you very much again for this award and thanks again for all the support during my PhD. Thank you for your attention. And now I would like to invite here on the stage um, Arthur Boutillon to present also his thesis. All right. 
Well, <clears throat> a great thanks for members of the jury. I'm really honored for this prize, and I will uh, present shortly my PhD work with a talk with a slightly shorter title for my PhD work. Um, if ah, right here, this is you. Well. This would have been you if you were a fish, but let's pretend it's the same. At some point, all of you were fertilized eggs, and at the beginning of your development, you divide and divide to form a ball of cell. Then at some point, this cell will start moving all around to form tissues, structures, and organs. This is called morphogenesis, creation of shape. This is my interest in research. During my PhD, <clears throat> I wanted to understand how cells are able to guide their migration in this complex system where everyone is moving around at the same time. Many people look at how cells guide their migration. Usually, there is a chemical signal that acts as a beacon. Cells orient themselves toward this source of chemical signals and migrate toward it. For groups of cells, it's pretty much the same. Groups of cells migrate collectively toward this source of chemical signal. However, in an embryo where everyone is moving and where movement can happen over a very long distance, this beacon can be really very far away or even move over time. So that cells have to find another way to guide the migration. This is basically what I studied. In order to address this question, I looked at a small group of cells that migrates collectively during gasolation of the fish, which is called the pollster. These cells here have to find a way without chemical gradient. And I wanted to understand how they manage to get oriented. Thanks to the amazing tools from the laboratory for, uh, for optics and bioscience, I developed uh, advanced techniques allowing me to tackle this question, among which three-dimensional laser ablations, functional genetics and uh, fine embryo surgery, live three-dimensional imaging and quantitative data analysis, and numerical simulations. This is my results in a nutshell. Rather than having a chemical signal in front of them, these cells actually detect a neighbor behind pulling them. And detecting this pulling force, they will orient opposite to this force and in turn, start pulling on the cell in front of it. Basically, this very simple system allows a row of cell to orient the row in front of it, then the row in front of it. In such way, a whole tissue can be oriented without the need of an external signal. This is a more detailed version of my results. Uh, this system, this novel way of coordinating uh, collective cell migration we have named it guidance by followers, and it's particularly interesting for several reasons. First, it's one of the first systems that do not involve chemical guidance, but also this system could be responsible for collective cell guidance in other contexts than embryonic development. For example, my, uh, guidance of group of cells migrating away from a tumor in the case of cancer. And with that, I would thank all the persons with whom I did my PhD, and included Claire Dessal here, <laughs> and you for your attention. So thank you for your presentation. So right now, I would like to invite all the awardees here on the stage to receive so their certificate.
Arthur Boutillon. like to acknowledge Bo Zhang Dong. Antoine Ferré. Palman. So now we will do a picture with all of you. So. Congratulations again. And now, to end, so I would like to congratulate all of you again for the excellent work that you have conducted. So that you have conducted at IP Paris and you should really be proud to be an alumni of IP Paris. I look forward to reading some interesting research that you will produce and hearing about your successes. I'm wishing you all successful and fulling, fulfilling career. Congratulations again. I would also like to thank all the graduate school staff. They are all here in the room and all the IP Paris that help us in you during all these years. So let's give all of you a round of applauses. And now, I think one of the most fun thing, so I will invite all of you, all the PhD graduates, to come on the stage for the photo, and after that, for the toasting, the hats, and afterwards, everyone is invited for the cocktail.